So before we get started, right away, I just want to say that there's going to be spoilers for Ishiguro's book, Never Let Me Go. Frankly, I think the book is better on second or third reading, and don't believe spoilers will ruin the experience of the book, but you make the decision that's best for you. So the novel, Never Let Me Go, has an interesting theory of art that I'd like to unpack here. To quickly summarize the plot, it seems like a pretty classic boarding school setting, but the boarding school, named Hailsham, is a place where human clones are raised to appreciate art and culture before they start donating their organs for a normal population. The novel takes the form of a fictional memoir of one of the students, named Kathy H. She traces her life from her school days through her career as a carer, somebody who comforts the clones as they go through four rounds of donations, which ultimately ends in them completing, which means giving their lives so that non-clones may live longer. It's a dystopia, though you wouldn't get that from Kathy's tone. It's void of any Katniss Everdeen rage or Winston Smith-like frustration. She's a carer, and she takes care of the reader. She takes great care not to stress us out too much. In the novel, Kathy has two close friends, Tommy, who has a big heart but limited artistic talent, and Ruth, an ambitious and emotionally manipulative mean girl type. In their truncated lives, art, storytelling, and the interpretation of art play a central role. To fully explore this novel's philosophy of art, I will narrow the scope of this video to three parts. The making of art at Halsham, the myth-making the students engage in while there, and the song that Kathy mentions throughout, which gives the novel its name, Never Let Me Go. The students at Hailsham seem to spend most of their days creating art, and then, at certain moments of the year, they do an exchange. Students trade in tokens to purchase each other's work for their personal collections. They have a genuine appreciation for the work that their peers create, and they search for pieces that they want to decorate their room or keep in a wooden chest under their beds. These are really the only possessions that they have, so they value the art highly. It's more than that, though. Kathy notes that this system has other, more subtle effects. She says, If you think about it, being dependent on each other to produce the stuff that might become your private treasures, that's bound to do things to your relationship. The art they produce bonded the students together. They were creating physical objects that in turn created human bonds between the students. Some students, like Tommy, were often picked on and left out, and this is partly attributed to his inability to create desirable works of art. In fact, it's noted that a particularly strong poet, Christie, was immune to bullying because she was such a great poet. It's hard not to fantasize about how great this dystopia is. People's social status depends on the quality of their verse. Amazing. Sign me up. But seriously, it's a pretty dark book. They harvest organs from humans until those humans die. Hopefully I'll reconcile how cool this sounds with how horrible it actually is before the video is over. So students build these collections, and Kathy reports that whenever she saw a Hellsham student later in life, they would reminisce and become nostalgic about their collections. It's clear then that in the universe of this novel, art bonds people together. It's a platform to show gratitude for the creations and imaginations of others. The nostalgia those students feel for their collections isn't for the objects, but for the friendships and connections represented by those objects. And that's powerful. Art is important. The students, though, they think that art can do more than just create meaningful human connections. They think that art might be able to save them from needing to donate their organs. There is a rumor that continually circulates at Halsham that if your art is good enough, It'll be selected for a gallery, and if the art gets attention at that gallery, then the students can have their donations deferred. In the climactic scene of the novel, we find out that this is entirely a myth, and that each new crop of students creates some new version of this myth. The art was intended to prove that the clones had souls, but that proof, the proof that they have souls, was only intended to prove to the rest of the world that they should be treated better not to end the donation program. Outside of Hailsham, where students evidently do not have the arts education of Kathy, Ruth, and Tommy, a different kind of myth appears. These other students believe that if you prove that you are properly in love, then you can ask for a deferral, as if love is enough to break a system that creates human beings in order to inflict a sterile medical violence upon them. 
Love is not salvation. In fact, the act of caring, which is transformed into an occupation in this civilization, is portrayed in this universe as cruelty. By caring about them or making their recovery rooms comfortable, it actually allows this system to continue inflicting this violence. Love cannot save you in this universe, nor implicitly in the real world. Tommy actually links these two myths together. He believes that perhaps the combination of art and love can save him. He believes that their artwork was taken not for a gallery, but as evidence. Evidence to be used in case two students claim to be in love. In that case, their art will serve as proof that the students aren't faking a relationship. Tommy's philosophy is that the artwork doesn't just show that they have a soul, it will show their ability to love. It will show their heart. So there is a myth that art can save us. There is a myth that love can save us. There is a myth that art and love can combine to save us. In the novel, none of this is true. All these are myths, but ironically, this myth-making, this ability to tell stories, build their communities, and the belief in the power of art and love is all the evidence that we, as readers, need to believe that they should be spared, redeemed, saved, whatever. In the end, their greatest and most meaningful creative endeavor was their ability to create these myths. There are plenty of other examples of students creating a mythology to explain the world that they were born into. There is the belief that Ruth has, for example, that if one of the students could find the person that they were copied from, they would have some insight into why they behave or act the way that they do. There is also the belief that Norfolk is a lost corner of England where if you lose something, it would end up in Norfolk and you could find it there. And all these myths are built on the interpretation of something real. They of course were copied from somebody, and so perhaps knowing who could explain something about themselves. A teacher once referred to Norfolk as a lost corner of England, and they interpreted it knowingly as a sort of lost and found corner of England. This capacity for interpretation is part of the myth-making in the story, and perhaps the best example of it comes from the title of the book. Never Let Me Go, in the novel, is a song on a cassette tape that Kathy listens to when she is on her own. She imagines an entire backstory to the song, which she knows isn't intended by the artist. She believes the song to be about someone who is told they cannot have children, then has a child anyway, and is holding on to that baby tightly and saying, never let me go, because she's afraid of losing it. She is aware that she cannot have a child, and there's no other evidence that Kathy H. laments this fact, but the song. And notably, her interpretation of the song helps her express this inexpressible and impossible desire. Art, in the case of this song, is a platform to distill and clarify one's thoughts that otherwise would, perhaps, remain repressed or undiscovered. And she's not the only one who uses the song in this way. The woman the students believe to be the owner of the mythical gallery once stumbles upon Kathy dancing slowly to the song while holding a blanket as though it's a baby, and the woman weeps at the sight. Later in the novel, she explains how she interpreted the scene. When I watched you dancing that day, I saw something else. I saw a new world coming rapidly, more scientific, efficient, yes, more cures for the old sicknesses, very good but a harsh, cruel world, and I saw a little girl, her eyes tightly closed, holding to her breast the old kind of world, one that she knew in her heart could not remain, and she was holding it and pleading never to let her go. That is what I saw. This tableau, made possible through the song, allowed her to clarify her thoughts about the donation program. This new world, with all its technological efficiency, had left genuine kindness itself behind. Without the platform created by the song, who knows if she would have ever been able to clearly identify what the world had lost in the scramble to deal with new technology before anybody had the chance to reconcile technology and medical progress with basic kindness and morality. So in the theory of art that this novel expresses, art does indeed reveal the soul. Tommy's small, vulnerable, imaginary animals surely do this. Art does create love. The bonds created between the students at Hailsham are real. Art does give us a platform to help us clarify our complicated thoughts. 
the different ways the characters interpret the eponymous song certainly shows us that. And art is what we hope will save us. Like, we hope that all those noble purposes are enough to save us. But they won't. Art will not save us. Not in the universe of Never Let Me Go. Only action can do that. In a reversal of the usual themes of novels taking place in a boarding school with teenagers, love and imagination will not redeem the characters. In fact, it is the opposite. The comfort that art gives us is dangerous here. The students should be angry. They should rage and should try to break things and break the system. Kindness and comfort are cruel in a world that has systemic violence. The actual moments of kindness in this novel appear on the surface as cruelty. They are moments when people aren't comforted, when they confront the horrors of their reality directly or are forced to hear the uncomfortable truth rather than the comforting mythology. Art and love in this novel will not save anyone. Only anger, cruelty, and discomfort have a chance at that. I found this philosophy of art really interesting. What about you? What do you think about this vision of art and the role that it can play in our culture? Please let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching.